uh, Israel, Jordan, Bahrain, and, uh, and Dota. And I, I was asked to give you a sense of the views from the region that we heard. This trip was in December. Uh, and I think the impressions that we got in December uh, have, have, have held up and have proven to be, uh, to be uh, accurate. And um, before I start, I wanted to just say a special thanks to Patrick Clausen and Simon Henderson, who um, did the yeoman's <coughs> work in both putting the trip together, keeping us on schedules that started one day at 5 in the morning and ended with this incredible <coughs> coffee evening at 1 in the morning in two di three different countries in one day. But we really enjoyed it and uh, for the wonderful <coughs> work in, in writing the report, which eventually you'll get to see, I guess. Um, uh, first of all, uh, how's the U.S. doing in this region? Um, I think the, the best sense that I heard, the best phrase that I, I heard when we were out there is that we have lost the ability to scare. And I think that's a very uh, apt way of putting it in, in both Israel and the Arab world, that um, while we, we mostly have a positive influence in the region, that region does want us to be able to scare uh, potential enemies. And by doing that, um, Unless the America has can retain the ability to scare, all the cascading instabilities that we talk about in the report uh, are worse. If uh, Iran gets nuclear weapons, the report talks about cascading instabilities of worsening Shia Sunni divide, uh, <coughs> furthering nuclear proliferation in the region, fueling an arms race, and, and essentially rushing the U.S. interest there. Um, and so we need to be able to regain our, our standings and our trust and our ability to scare and, and to support the positive side of U.S. engagement in that as well. But I think every, every country we, we visited, um, we, we heard that the U.S. just doesn't trust us to do what they need us to do. And what does that mean in practice? It means that they don't trust us that we'll follow through on our defense commitments. We heard that repeatedly when we discussed the nuclear umbrella issue. Uh, they don't think we have the staying power in the region. They're petrified we might leave. Um, they fear that we don't have the resolve and the stamina and the clout to really resolve the Middle East peace process. I actually don't think any of those are true, but you definitely hear that through the, through the perception. You hear a real hunger in the region for U.S. Uh, re-engagement uh, on both the Iranian threat and the Arab-Israeli peace process. Uh, and you hear that they just don't know Obama well enough to, to really trust him yet. Uh, I think there's enormous potential there, but they just, they're asking us, what, what can we expect? But we are here time and time again, just tell us what you're going to do. And obviously with a new administration, uh, that's going to take time. I think since we were there in, in December, you've had S Secretary Clinton and, and the selection of the Special Envoy Mitchell obviously signaling that they plan to, uh, to re-engage on a on a broad level uh, and begin to form these partnerships, which I think will end up uh, being very welcome in the region. Um, how does the country see Iran? I would say that the region, both in Israel and the Arab countries that we visited, view um, the century-old struggle uh, with Persia for hegemony in the region as shifting in Iran's interest. Um, and that makes them nervous on a, a, a very broad level. They're deeply concerned that Iran will use its proxy to gain hegemony in the region. And time and time again, we've heard, just deal with Syria, then, then Iran doesn't have a doorway into this neighborhood. Um, and for Israel, I think, obviously, the most clear and immediate threat is an Iranian uh, nuclear uh, weapon used against them. And I think for us, we, it's no doubt in our minds, uh, the Israelis are, are very blunt about it, um, that it's quite serious in acting on its own against a, a nuclear armed Iran. And, and two things came up in our discussions that it were, were put it in a different perspective and time frame for myself. Um, there are others in the room who may have already heard this, but it was new to me that uh, I always assumed that it would be a little bit further down the road when Israel was faced with an actual potential of a short time fuse on an Iranian uh, actual building of a nuclear weapon. And what we heard are, are two other scenarios which, which actually move the timetable up significantly. Uh, the first is that if Iran puts in an adequate missile defense system, Bill was talking about the Russian stand, that's a very real threat. If Israel sees that coming, they could well move much more quickly than whether or not, regardless of whether Iran has a system. And the second is if Iran begins to hide its capabilities. If they can't find the, the materials to attack, they'll, they'll move before they can. So they're clearly watching it um, 
very effectively. We did discuss the possibility of a nuclear umbrella everywhere we went um, at Patrick's strong urging, actually. Um, and uh, uh, Israel's very clear they do not want a nuclear umbrella. Uh, they want the freedom to act. They don't want to be limited by any kind of uh, cooperation on that front. They want the freedom to uh, defend itself. Um, uh, uh, on, it, on its own timetable and develop its own military operation. 